Okay, here we're going to look at m different types of microscopes. There's a couple of general categories that they all fit into, uh, and we're going to investigate some of them. In class, we mainly work with one type, but they are different ones for different purposes. Just like people have different jobs, there's different ones for different substances a scientist may want to look at. Students may think they need a microscope to look at their small, tiny grades, but in this case, we're going to be looking mainly at cells and different sizes. So starting with the first one, the compound light, this is the one you're probably most familiar with. Looks very similar to this in many cases. There might be some variations depending on the manufacturer. We're looking at compound light. So there's a light source at the bottom. There's these ocular lenses. Um, here it's basically using a magnification with the light. These are focused glass lenses and the image is really being formed in the back of your eye as you look through. Uh, and it's basically resolving images about 500 times better than what the human eye can see if you were just to look at something in general there. All the parts are labeled here. You can see here the ocular lens in particular, or the eyepiece is located up here. These are the objective lenses uh, down here, and those can have different magnifications. When you're looking at magnification, when you're actually taking um, images or looking at pictures, you want to be sure you're taking into account the objective lens and also any magnification that the ocular lens uh, may add to that. Sometimes it's a factor of 10. So if this was uh, times 100, it would be times it by an additional 10. It would be actually 1,000 times um, more strong. And the objective lenses, you have the fine the focus, you have the coarse focus, the light source, the diaphragm to allow more or less light through. So if you're having trouble finding a slide, um, something on a slide that looks like it's on there, Oh, you always want to start at low power and you want to adjust the light. If you put too much light, it may shine right through and basically make it impossible to see the specimen. These are some images taken with a compound light microscope. These are cheek cells, chloroplast, you see muscle cells here. Um, really nice to find and here looking at different um, cell stages. And these are all taken with a compound light microscope. You should be familiar with what microscope images that they produce. Um, so you're able to identify that. Okay, getting a little bit more unique, something you may not be familiar with, the transmission electron microscope, or the TEM. Uh, this is, allows electrons to pass through the specimen. This is a max magnification, is very strong, about 100,000 times better than the human eye. Very complex, very expensive piece of equipment here. And what it's the reason why it's, it has an electron gun, essentially, it's a passing those electrons through the specimen. How those images look, and it's typically for very small items such as viruses, what the polio virus looks like, and this is taken through a TEM or a transmission electron microscope, smallpox tissue section, and this bacillus bacterium, all taken with transmission electron microscopes. Another type is called scanning electron, SEM. This is where the specimen is coated with a very thin coated metal. An electron beam is passed across the specimen. It's like a literally like a scan that occurs. Think of it like a copier machine and it's viewed on a large screen, TV screen. And again, you don't have to know the complexities of everything here, but again, we're using electrons. The key part here is it's coated with a thin metal. The other one, went, transmission went through, this is just a scanning of the actual surface. As a result, we get some very detailed, very unique images. What pollen grains look like. This is the adhesive on a post-it note. You can see, well, we think it's like kind of sticky and flat. This is actually, it looks very zoomed in. Now, because we're scanning uh, and we're getting bounce back from the electrons, typically images come back as black and white. However, through modern day's tools, we're able to colorize some of those images to give them a bit more of a vivid appeal, and make it easier to spot certain things. For example, here the yellow structures almost look a little blended in. You might not even notice that they're there in this black and white image. Here they're very vibrant and very easy to tell. This one's a little bit more complicated, the immunofluorescence light microscope. What this uses, and this is an example of it, it's using antibodies developed against a specific protein that have a special dye attached to them. What's happening is the antibodies are binding to something in particular with this fluorescent dye, allowing it to be illuminated with an ultraviolet or a black light light source. And this allows mapping and digit and distribution of specific proteins within a cell. So how does this look? This might be a little confusing, a little bit different than what you're used to. So I think this is a great summary. 
And these are both kind of showing very similarly the same thing. We have our antigen, and we're trying to identify this little green circle here. So in the first case here, we have a primary antibody with the tag on it. Well, basically, we are putting this antibody in solution, we're bouncing it around, and it's finding this one little green circle, and it's binding specifically and only to that green circle. Now, because it's bound to that only that green circle, that is the only spot this actual um, fluorophore, this basically light-emitting substance, will be attached. Now, this allows us to identify this. The secondary aminofluorescence is kind of very similar to the first one, where we're still identifying the green circle here. However, we're first using a primary antibody to bind to that, and then we're using our secondary antibody that actually is labeled or tagged to bind to that antibody. So what this allows for, as you can see here, multiple bindings. Here, one, um, one green circle, one antibody's binding might produce a weaker signal. Here, we're allowing our secondary antibody can bind multiple times to that original or that single primary antibody. Because of that, we're able to get maybe a stronger signal. So both of these are accomplishing the same thing. We're identifying a very specific um, component of the cell. So this shows a good example. Antibodies are extremely specific. As a result, we can label them to look at different things. So this first image, we're identifying this particular DNA, and that's blue. Here we're using green to identify a different structure, and here we're using red to identify another structure. So when we just add that single antibody, we just get the blue, we just get the green, we just get the red. If we combine all those antibodies, we're able to now see a better picture of the cell of where specifically different components might be located. And that's the power of the aminofluorescence light microscope image, is that we're able to determine or hash out where different things might be located based on their color because we're using specific antibodies to bind to specific antigens or specific proteins in certain cases. So um, fair questions on quizzes or tests might be showing an image and you have to identify what microscope was used. So if you're playing along in our home game, I have a series of images and the last slide will have the answer. So I'm simply not going to go through and answer the, answer the questions. You can play along and say, what microscope made this image? This is image one. How about image two? Looking at the microscopes that we learned ahead of time, what image, looking at this, what microscope may have made this image? For those continuing, number three, again, what microscope was used here? And the last one, four. Again, don't let the colors fool you. As we learned before, some can be colorized, some cannot be colorized. Oh, actually, I added two more. So another prime example. Hint, the microscopes may be used more than once. And this is our last one here. What microscope made this image? So for those looking for the answers, playing along in our home game, here's our six answers to the six different images. You'll notice the compound light microscope was not used in any of these. You're probably very familiar with that one, so I included these, but please realize that the compound light microscope image is fair game for tester quizzes. Hope this was helpful.